Hello and welcome to another episode of the MXGP podcast show on Vital MX, or should that be the MXON podcast show, because this episode is all about the Monster Energy FIM Motocross of Nations at Matterley Basin. But maybe not what you would expect. We're not going to break down the racing and the individual performances, because honestly, they don't necessarily mean much in the grand scheme of things. Great on the day, and now just filed away in the history books, and that's that. So we'll talk about the event as a whole, what the paddock was saying, what the future looks like, and some current affairs in MXGP, because it's already been a busy week on that front. I'm your host, Lewis Phillips, and of course, as normal, I want to thank Polisport, All Balls Racing, and EVS Sports for their support of this podcast. And let me jump in now and say there was a lot of interest in supporting this podcast at the Nations. So if you do want to get involved, don't hesitate. There is room. Some people were concerned that we were full. We are not. We can do segments. We can add little banner items for your company. So get in touch and you could join this magical mystery tour, which includes some insight, some laughs and a lot of bullshit. I couldn't think of a better word than that. Uh, as I said, I'm your yeah, host, I'm Lewis Phillips, Sounding. joined by the man who has finished a book, an achievement that very few people can say. He is in the clear, and so we should have a very different experience today. Maybe a weight's been lifted. Who knows? It's Adam Wheeler. How are you doing? Hey, Lewis. That is the most professional introduction you've ever done to the MHTP podcast. Uh, what's going on? I mean, you were that kind of energised and motivated from Matterley Basin that you've turned over a new leaf. Well, I'm still very much on a high. And to be honest with you, will this high ever end? I don't know. But it's nice to be liked. And the Matterley Basin paddock had an abundance of that. So here I am in the putting my best foot forward for the people who like Lewis. Because that's what they deserve. They deserve my best foot forward. So here I am. People are nice to your face. And that's the important thing. Okay, and that's the end of that's the bubble burst. <laughs> but the, more importantly, uh, I mean, I will answer your question in a moment, but more importantly, did you find Lisa? Honestly, the amount of fans that either asked me where Lisa was or screamed at me from afar, where's Lisa, was touching. <laughs> it really made me realise that we can move a needle here. I'm not sure from what I heard that Lisa is so stoked, which is sad, <laughs> but... Collateral damage, really. It's fine. Because the positive... You definitely need to get a t-shirt made. Honestly, I think I like stuff like that because it proves that what we're doing here is people care. Because if they didn't care, they wouldn't pick up on the nuances that we have. Um, but people were on that. And I had a lot of DMs say people sending me photos of Lisa, saying I found her. Um, and you know what? It looked like Lisa had a good weekend. So I'm happy with that because we found Lisa and she seemed fine. Good for her. Excellent. Yes, good for And um, yes, thank you for acknowledging that I finished this book. Um, I think we chatted about it before, but it's actually called uh, Motorcycle Grand Prix Inside of Tales and World Championship Racing. Hardly an imaginative title, but that's uh, what the publishers wanted to go with to make it sort of sales worthy. And uh, yeah, it was done on Monday afternoon. That was the reason why I missed the nations for the first time since 2001. Uh, also work in the Japanese MotoGP. And I think if I would have attempted that, well, it would have been from the hotel anyway because of the time it was on in the morning. But by the sounds of things in Matterley Basin, the uh, media room, media center setup wasn't the strongest in terms of connectivity and um, info communications. So, yeah, it would have been very difficult indeed. But, yeah, the book's done. Um, it's actually the third one I've written. I've done two in motocross. One was like a, a autobiography of Jamie Dobb uh, in 2003. I had and no idea I you a, wrote that. Yeah, and a yearbook. There was a yearbook called Motocross 2004, uh, which I did with my good friend, Ray, our good friend, Ray Archer, uh, and his excellent photography. Uh, so, yeah, this is the third one, but it's the first about road racing. But there's loads of motocross inside. I um, mean, one chapter I talk about how um, elite level riders have this kind of gift that nobody else has, you know, and what is that gift and how are they different to good riders? You know, what makes them great? And one of the interviews is uh, Jorge Prado from a trip to Majora. So he brings some sort of insight into how these magicians make things possible on two wheels. And by the way, I also, in your fantastic introduction to this podcast, was very pleased that you put a Beatles song title. So, uh, you know, your wider consciousness of uh, popular culture is obviously expanding. 
obviously I know what I did, but for the people that don't know, what song title was this? A Magical Mystery Tour. Oh, I was thinking of Scooby-Doo and the Magical Mystery Bus or whatever it's called. Oh, Scooby. How can you go from the Beatles to Scooby-Doo? I've never, honestly, podcast now. I never actually watched Scooby-Doo as a kid. So that was more just my wider consciousness pulling that. But it's fine. After, uh, after we finish this podcast, go and listen to the Magical Mystery Tour album on Spotify and tell me will what it, you think. Will it touch me? It's good. Yeah, okay. well, everything they did was good. So did you enjoy The Nations from Home? Uh, immensely. I mean, that last moto, you can't argue with it. Although it was quite shocking to see the state of Matali Basin. I mean, it was a little bit of a 2017 rerun in terms of the weather, it seemed. Uh, is that fair to say? I mean, obviously, I was there in 2017. I knew how wet it was and how it felt like the whole circuit was submerged in a low cloud. And it looked kind of that way from the TV. But then the amount of ruts and, and just, you know, it's ridiculous. I mean, you could see riders almost sort of taking off and landing in them. And you kind of thought... I understand why a high percentage of the gate are just thinking, you know, I'm not up for this today because it just looked perilous. And then to watch the Hondas and, you know, a couple of other riders, Eli Tomac initially attacking them with sort of, sort of such a verve was, uh, was really impressive. I honestly, um, I don't classify it as wet at all on Sunday because, and this is my, um, this is how I judge it. At no point did I think to myself, oh, this is wet. Let me get out of the rain. You know, like I was, I, I was fine. Like walking around, I was like, this is literally no problem. So I don't know if that's really an accurate. I'm not sure the weatherman uses that, but. Well, it's just a British thing as well. Maybe. It was cold and it was, like you say, low cloud, windy. The wind was bitter. Um, but, and goggles were an issue because it was that misty rain that doesn't really impact the track besides making it slick. But it's a nightmare for goggle prep. Um, the goggle lane certainly got good use but I don't, yeah no it was certain it was much better than 2017 2017 was a disaster this was fine as far as the competitiveness goes it was a disaster in other areas that's clear did they did they make a mistake with the track prep so my understanding is that a couple of weeks before the event they brought in all new soil and put it all over the track then it immediately downpoured afterwards and turned it into a quagmire so they had to then scrape all of the new soil off and essentially trash it. But there was still some of it left there and that's why it was so much softer than normal, is my understanding. Okay. Right. I mean, because, because yeah, as you see with the nations, it doesn't matter whether it's Tuchental, which is one of the hardest packed circuits on the GP calendar. For that particular race, somehow they work, I don't know, maybe usually they have a bit more of a lead time, but they... You know, the track crew or the organiser in front motor racing, their team make an extra, extra effort to get a track looking pristine for that particular race. And I thought it looked phenomenal, like on Saturday and everything else. It was like Matterley Basin, you know, the best it could be. But it does seem that it was, I don't know, something went awry because the, the, the way it got so, so roughy was um, a little bit over the top. Yeah, every, every single rider clarified that they have never seen Matterley Basin like that, um, which is essentially what we are saying. But to your point, I loved the track changes. Um, fairly minor, but I felt like they did really bring it together nicely. Um, they, we didn't lose any significant sections. We essentially tightened it all up, not in a, um, not in a layout perspective, but as far as just bringing it all in a little bit. Because it was always the longest track on the MXGP calendar. Probably still is. Yeah. But... It's yeah, now I'd, more I'd on par with what you'd expect. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, it, it looked good. I mean, it looked like the attendance was pretty decent as well. It's always so hard to tell how many people are at Matterley Basin. But, uh, you know, your point about the soil too, um, that's it seems to make sense because Matterley has actually made the, the base level terrain there. I can remember sort of the guy who designed the track, Johnny Douglas Hamilton, telling me how you know, they needed to make several passes with a, is it a screening machine uh, to be able to sort of crush the sort of flint. I'm not sure what stone it is there uh, to, to really, you know, soften things up so they could do something with the circuit. So uh, yeah, I'm not able to verify, of course, if Steve Dixon and his team did bring extra soil in to, to make the nation circuit. But, you know, it seemed that way. Well, to be honest, I'm confused by that as well, because... Um, Tomac had a bloody nose from a rock. Uh, Roman Fevre had two black eyes from rocks. Has Matterley always been this rocky? Because I've never heard complaints until now of rocks yeah, yeah. striking riders. 
yeah the base of it is really stony and that's why it's always needed extra work and maybe why also they imported stuff in but yeah i, mean, I don't remember too many uh, i mean tales of roost yeah of course but that's just motocross but then you know black eyes is a bit unusual many people just using sort of such soft bendy goggles these days i mean perhaps protection needs to be a bit more prioritized in that that respect well riders ditching goggles as well obviously um ups the risk of that um so we're agreed that the nations from a racing perspective was maybe the best ever uh, racing was fantastic on saturday fantastic on sunday encapsulated what the nations is with um tomac uh, sorry jet versus geyser and then the qualifying race on saturday uh, mxgp started with hunter jeffrey tim prado tomac roxon fevra all together it was literally the dream scenario so from a racing perspective, from a competitive perspective, this was a brilliant advertisement of why the nations matters, correct? Yes. I, can, I know you've got another point, but can we just uh, go on a slight tangent there for a moment? Because uh, working the Japanese MotoGP, which was very staid, probably the most boring race of the year, we've actually been talking about the nations on MotoGP podcast because the same day you had that absolute corker of a race. Um, in Jet Lawrence, I think it's almost to be accepted now that he's going to bring another worldly level of performance. And watching him in ONA last year, an event that was so freaky for the climate in itself. I mean, it should have been more like what we saw, you know, last weekend at Matale. But the way he rode was unbelievable. And I just wanted, Lewis, I wanted to ask you this. I, I wanted to ask you since, you know, the moment it happened, basically. But Tim Geiger, if he had ridden like that on more occasions this year in MSGP, would he have got those extra points enough to take the title? But then should we also credit the kind of racer that he is in that he plays the long game, he looks at consistency, doesn't take stupid risks because that could have gone disastrously for him in Matali Basin. I mean, he came out a double winner. And if he had tried that, say, the British Grand Prix, it could have really backfired. He could have you know, picked up an injury like Febber and been counted out of the title race. Yeah, well, I guess to start that... Um... I feel happy, I feel pleased, because on the previous podcast, we discussed how, I think I said, or maybe you did, I think it was me, that there had been, I just felt like there was not a spark from Tim this year besides Switzerland. It was very flat across the board. And I spoke to a few people close to him, and they kind of agreed that aside from Switzerland and now Matali, that spark was missing, and he was probably overthinking the point situation, counting points too much, accepting a podium too much because it was good for the long run. Um, so yeah, if he could have uncorked this more often, then it probably would have proved to be advantageous. But like you say, Tim's got a past of throwing it away also. So you want to avoid that. And actually, I had an hour long talk with Carmichael about this because I was trying to, I'm working on like a longer, I don't really know what I'm doing it with, with it yet, but I'm essentially gathering information to do a longer form piece on the mechanics of working with a rider. And essentially how a rider manages their situation, but also how the people around a rider can benefit them by handling the situation correctly. And my my uh, way of relating this to Tim is Marcus told you in Majora that the goal was to get 50 points per Grand Prix. Um, and that maybe, maybe that was, that message was too clear to Tim. Maybe that was what kind of spurred on this uh, mathematics exercise which 2024 seemed to be for him yeah I think that's a great point and also since the uh, the qualification points came in maybe people are looking at it too mathematically both in terms of what key you can gain and what you can lose uh, with events being pushed so close together as well in a 20 Grand Prix season in, in quite a sort of tight turnaround so yeah that came into it but just watching guys here at Matali it was like a throwback to 2016 and um, I kind of wished we'd seen a little bit more of that on occasions this year. And it was clearly a case of Tim not giving two fucks. I was like, this is the last race of the year. I'm just going to send it. Because in that last moto on the last lap, I thought, okay, he's backing off. You know, Lawrence has won this one. And to come back and make that move the way he did, it was like, wow, you know. Um, you know, it was it was unbelievable. I thought it was, you know, fair play to him. But it was, it, you could almost, you can almost feel the frustration of maybe a year and missing out on the world title, you know, by a handful of points, just sort of entering his throttle hand there as he made it happen. Well, how about this though? Um, 
I think we speculated on a previous podcast as well about how 2025 would be interesting to see if Tim still has it. It being what we saw at Massey Basin. And obviously it is still there. But the two times we saw it this year, Switzerland and Matterley, very similar tracks. Deep, snaky ruts. Um, certainly track type that would suit Tim. So is it possible that actually, as he now moves into the latter stages of his career, which we're kind of there, um, maybe it's only possible for him to find this, whatever this is, on these type of tracks where he's super comfortable? I think also the fact that Prado is not going to be part of him. Prado has two extremely strong traits, which is his starts, which gives him a little bit of advantage every single Grand Prix, and the fact that he just consistently posts points. Uh, you know, he could have a terrible Grand Prix, but then suddenly fire back with three whole shots and take three moto wins. By that, I mean the heat and the two two races on the Sunday. Whereas with Hurlings, I kind of get the feeling that guys are sort of inching along a plank with him, and he can kind of think, well, which one of us is going to fall off this first? because the other one's going to win the championship when that person goes. Whereas Prado's not only a little bit further along the plank because of his starting, but also less likely to, to topple off. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I think that does play a bigger part with Tim as well, more than any other rider who's on that plank with him. I, yeah. I honestly think that impacts Tim more than it does anyone else. I think everyone else looks at it very black and white. But Tim, again, maybe too methodical, is assessing what's going on around him too much. Whereas in his championship winning years, uh, 19, 20, and 16, maybe less so 16, but certainly 19 and 20. Um, he just pinned it. Yeah, and he had such a big lead by the halfway point that there was almost no need to overthink it. It was like, this is great. I'm just going to go for it because it's all coming up to him. Um, so maybe when he gets in that position where it's, too tense and it's too close to call um it almost exposes some of his weaknesses personality wise and mentally maybe um this again this is kind of what i was trying to get to the bottom to with carmichael of what he saw the faults in his rivals as far as like, like for instance he only learned something about james stewart last year which kind of filled in a gap for him as to why he was the way he was when battling with him and it was like fascinating yeah. like so I'm trying, I don't even know what I'm doing, but I'm trying something. Um, yeah, nice name drop of Carmichael, by the way. Well, a little nod to you. My, Rick, my friend Rick. I was talking to Rick. <laughs> um, 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 but my, so from a competitive point of view, Nations was amazing. From a organization side, and not maybe not even an organization side, from a logistics side, maybe, the finer details were maybe missing. And maybe it was you who told me this. Someone said to me that in front said that having the final GP a week before the Nations and a final GP where they crowned four champions um, was not a wise idea and certainly put them on the back foot. But yeah, like you say, we had no Wi-Fi all weekend, um, which essentially meant that the Nations wasn't covered from a media perspective, and it wasn't. Um, and just traffic getting in was an issue. Traffic getting out was an issue. Um, parking was a bit of a mess and a free-for-all. It just wasn't tidy, uh, uh, to use a really bland explanation. But um, it almost makes me wonder if it will call questions about bringing the nations back to Matterley. Matterley has the scope and the size to be able to handle this event. Uh, you know, you could easily get more spectators in there. But like you say, they're... I think Steve Dixon does a tremendous job. And for years, we've always praised the passion, you know, it's sustained passion. I mean, the fact that he's not tired of having to wade through all the bureaucracy and the nightmares of logistics to get this event going um, on a smaller scale with the British Grand Prix is, you know, a testament in itself. But, you know, I mean, Steve has to try and, and balance the books and make it happen. And if you don't suddenly splash out much, much more money on um, infrastructure and uh, security, things to get things you know on a really really high professional level then you're always going to be struggling to a bit and then you need the weather or you have like an accident that causes massive traffic backup um you know i think the traffic plan with the local council is always like a topic of debate but yeah i mean the it was a shame the coverage and the wi-fi situation because you know you rely also on fans sharing stuff on their own social media that's kind of how it organically spreads the, the stuff you know from from big events like this so that has to be another provision now you can't just have major events like this with sort of 40 50 000 people and put it in the sticks where people can't communicate anymore otherwise you're missing a trick but uh i mean 
going back to Matali again, Lewis, I uh, I was underwhelmed by the decision when it was announced. I'm also underwhelmed by the fact that they're going back to Erne in such a short amount of time. I mean, there are really no other circuits in Europe that can handle an event of this size. Are we at that point now? Well, it seems that way, but I feel like we were at that point 10 years ago and it's getting worse because I'm adamant that I read a press release from the FFM and in front I think it was at Assen in 2019, where they said the nations will be in France every three years, and it will alternate between Saint-Jean and Ernay, which I'm fine with. Even Ernay every six years is maybe a bit much, but I'm fine with that. Um, no, it was so every I'm... five. It was, okay. like it, had to, it was going to come back to Ernay every five years. That's why it was in 15, and then it was supposed to be 20, but yes. it didn't happen because of the pandemic. And then, you know, obviously 2024... That was like the time for it to happen. But the fact we're going back again there the year after the US, you kind of think, and also you did, you know, you rolled the dice big time with the weather last year. And I just think, you know, in, in 2026. Anyway, I mean, I think it's just good. Also, it's rewarding to other nations to go to other places. Uh, you know, why not uh, somewhere in Spain? We just had three Spanish Grand Prix. You're telling me there isn't a site in Spain that could do the nations? I just don't, like, is St. John just not eligible anymore why it's a fight like we've done it before it works i don't understand why we now can't do that i mean it's french it's typically old school french which does bring issues but certainly it's more suitable than erne i would say as far as um logistics go so i don't understand well, just that the track. And this will frustrate you even more so from what i hear we're going to iron man in 2027 so not next year no, no, oh, oh. 2025 and 2027. Okay, well, I mean, I, oh, why not? I mean, Red Bud's been done twice. No, so but two a, years apart? Yeah, but that's always the goal, wasn't it? To have the nations every two years I think it was US. every. I think it was every three, wasn't it? Uh, well. Um, but also, every two or three years is fine, different tracks. But like, I don't know, if this comes to fruition, I will be kind of a bit like, okay, this is a real... Um, admission that we don't have many options. Yeah. Uh, options or just like willing promoters because as we've been saying with the track dedication and, and set up at Matterley it's a big undergoing. So, uh, yeah. I wonder um, well we got some heat from Italians in the last podcast because we said there was no uh, suitable Italian venue and the fans, the Italians amongst us wanted Majora and said, you're idiots, you should have thought of Majora, but we know that that can't happen because of the uh, local council, the issues with the law. Um, so yeah, actually, just a little rant. If you're listening to this podcast, we're not just like theoretically talking shit, we kind of know what's going on. So like, we're not dumb and don't think of Majora, we know that kind of isn't an option anymore. Um, and Trentino would never work. Um, it would have to be, also, essentially, we need to transition to MotoGP circuits at some point for the nations. We just have to. The fact that there's no other realistic option apart from Majora uh, is borne out by the fact that one of the last nations to be held there was done on a road race track in Francia Corta in 2009, I want to say. So there you go. That's, uh, that's the sort of the situation we're in when it comes to Italian circuits. Yeah, it's, I mean, Madrid into Xanadu, that would work. Yes, you, I mean, it would, it would depend a little bit on how they could utilise the surrounding uh, land and also trying to wedge the nations in around that sort of shopping centre could be chaotic. Yeah, if you because, add like, uh, if, you, if you treble, double the treble the crowd, it would be tough. Yeah, because I think what happens is if we go there for the nations at 7pm on a Saturday, all 30,000 fans are going to just descend on the shopping mall for dinner and it would just that would create more, almost more of a health and safety issue than the event itself. Um, You're just worried about getting your five guys, aren't you? I mean, if yes. there's a queue of 200 people trying to get in five guys, then you're screwed. Yes. And um, <laughs> I, I would expect a VIP line. Uh, and I'm sh <laughs> I, would, I would expect that. Um, but no, so yeah, Matterley wasn't, maybe wasn't the best example of what the nations can be from an event perspective, but racing, brilliant. Well, that's where we're at. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, hundred percent, and that sort of always covers a multitude of sins, doesn't it? How was your in, uh, your live paddock show? Well, as you know, perhaps the greatest hurdle that Lewis has had to overcome in his career is the public speaking. Fair? 
Yes. But how was the anxiety level? I wasn't nervous at all. Honestly, it was the biggest, really? like, it was the biggest um, reminder of how far I've come. I had zero, even, cont- it didn't even play on my mind, which is, like, like I say, it's the biggest sign of personal growth for me, because I'm like, this is unbelievable. Um, the first time I went on a studio show, I almost had to be taken away in multiple ambulances. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just a, that was just an intimate room. And that's where Elisa was there. So I found Lisa. Um, <laughs> um, um, yeah, honestly, and brilliant crowd. I think from in front's perspective, it kind of showed what was possible. And I briefly spoke to them afterwards and said like, you know, like the podcast I do with Adam, this, because although it was a Pulp MX show, it was my idea. I kind of got screwed. It was my idea. <laughs> I invited Steve to come take part in my idea. Because originally I was thinking me, Steve and you, and then it's the MXGP podcast show, plus Steve. I set the meeting up with David. I led the meeting with David and explained the concept. And then somehow it ended up Pop MX. So just to be clear, my idea. Right. Um, but so I said Canadian to Canadian invasion. Yep. I said to him in front afterwards, I said, like, with what we do with this podcast and stuff like this, I think there is scope for us to really be beneficial. And I would like to have some sort of discussion about how that looks. Even on the show, it was mentioned that Chase Sexton uses my MXGP TV login. And, you know, in front, keen on the money. So they immediately said to me, <laughs> is that true? And I was like, yeah, but you could use me because if you give me codes, I can hand them out to the American riders. And that's only beneficial. You should be thinking of this. So anyway, show was a success, fan-wise and business-wise. Um, and honestly, I was concerned about being heckled because there are some people who massively hate Lewis in the world. None of them showed up, thankfully. Um, they must have got the times wrong. Um, <laughs> so yeah, all good. And after Majora, you were you witnessed the euphoria, the glee, the... Wind the Italian Grand Prix, wings. not the nations. Yes, you but you witnessed yes. what it did to me personally. This weekend, maybe topped it. Wow! It's well. well I mean... First of all, Ben Watson was there as a spectator, so I just stood with him all weekend, which already <laughs> amazing. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, honestly, great, great weekend. And I was sad leaving the track because it was over. Did you get some decent time with Jeffrey? Because that was what you missed at Majora. Well, I'd, knowing that what I missed with Majora, I got on that immediately on Friday. And okay. immediately, so by Friday midday, I'd done Jeffrey. I ticked that box. Went and congratulated Prado, shook his hand, said, happy for you, my friend. We discuss his plan coming up. Right. Which Did he not, like, uh, admonish you for not backing him in your predictions for MXGP title success this year? So he said... I said, you were the best guy at the beginning and you were the best guy at the end. You deserve it. And he went, yeah, but you didn't think I was the best in the middle, did you? And I was like, oh. <laughs> I, I was like... Two out of three. Two out I was three. like, or thank you is also a suitable reply to my compliment. <laughs> <laughs> um, but once I've said this many times as well, I'm convinced we have no fans listening to this podcast because the industry... So leaving the track on Sunday, very upset because my weekend on the clouds was over almost literally as well. The cloud cover was so low. Um, And then I finished my work at midnight and I was like, you know what? I want more. So I shut my laptop at midnight, put on my shoes and I went to the monster party and Ben Watson was there. So I got more of that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then the monster party, all I did was discuss this podcast because There are so many mechanics and stuff who listen to this podcast who I've never spoken to, but they were there and they wanted to break down. So Rasmus was there. Yeah, was he still smiling? Rasmus Jorgensen, our friend, the team manager of the title winning, well, one, two, uh, MX2 team. Our dear friend Rasmus Jorgensen, I said to him, Ben is here. We can do our deal tonight. And (laughs) the crowd, the, the surrounding immediate crowd who weren't even listening all burst out in laughter. And I was like what? And they were like, we listen, we know that joke. And I was like, oh, bloody, bloody hell. So we just got everyone in the paddock. Um, But no. Did you do the deal? No. Oh, Lewis. That was your Um, time. I mean, he's probably had a few, you know, Red Bull Vodkas. I did have a, I did get a selfie of me, Ben and Rasmus. Does that count for anything? Where was the monster party then? Was it at the track? No, in Winchester. 
right, I don't okay. I don't mess around with the track version. No one want no one wants to stay in the field at midnight. No one wants that. Yeah. But everyone's out on that. Um There was a very good one in the Red Bull hospitality in twenty ten in Thunder Valley. That was pretty good. And then the very first monster party at the nation was oh eight Donington Park, I wanna say, where Would I you have led Billy that? McKenzie had uh Billy McKenzie would have—he was climbing up the the stanchion of the the monster rig and was kind of swinging from it. Where I thought, okay, uh, this is getting a bit out of hand now. Yeah, there's also a story from 2019 where Sean Simpson attempted to crowd surf or something and ended up knocking himself <laughs> yes. out or something. Yeah, um, he went to, uh, to casualty. It's the Scots. The Scots are the problem. <laughs> um, anyway, back on topic. So before we move on to current affairs, a couple of notes from my chats in the paddock. Yes. Most importantly, I discussed the moon landing with with Glenn. Right. Which, as you know, a big chip on my shoulder that I had to remove. He was very aware of how I felt about it. So that's good. I'm glad <laughs> that my messaging is reaching the wider wider audience. And he said he doesn't understand why he did it, no. But it did look good. And I agreed with him. So we found a middle ground. So that's good. One box yes. ticked. Um, Jeffrey's getting some heat because he said to me, and I want to clarify this because I think, I think I can see where the misconception is happening. He said to me after the race that he, I think his exact quote was, I expected Jet to be more fast, way faster than me. Which, typical Jeffrey, very honest, a very blunt um, and the Americans are getting very outraged by this, saying that he beat you by 20 seconds. How can you say that? But what Jeffrey is saying, I think, is he's actually complimenting Jet and saying, he, I think he's so good, I expected him to be a minute down the track. Um, but everyone's taking it as an insult. But actually, I think Jeffrey meant it as a compliment. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like a... No, it's not even a backhanding compliment. I just... Jeffrey has this sort of uh, tendency to say stuff that can be construed both ways. I mean, I'm not surprised that he sort of jumped off social media very, very early in his career, uh, you know, like Facebook or whatever else. I can remember being at a Grand Prix in Portugal in a hotel in Agada, and he was, uh, we were checking in at the same time, and he was just kind of sitting on the sofa, flicking through Facebook, sort of shaking his head. And, uh, you know, I mean, this must have been around about maybe just during the title fight with Tommy Searle, so what, 2013? 12 uh what, and 12? yeah yeah i think he learned pretty early not to sort of get involved with sort of fan or community comments on a personal level but yeah i you know um i had this thing going around in my head about hurlings actually because i did wonder if you were maybe slightly underawed by his performance and matter did you expect a bit better i mean i was not surprised a little bit i thought maybe he would be vying for top three or a win but having seen the state of the track on sunday knowing mhgp has just finished the long campaign and also he just didn't really get the starts uh you know that's that's kind of been the ingredient for 2024. yeah very weird as well because on friday when i spoke to him he said the netherlands was a fifth or sixth place team like he really oh, downplayed okay. basically his participation in the event said he was ecstatic that Jet had moved to the open class because it meant that Hurlings could watch him ride, which is very off-brand for Hurlings. Um, then said the Netherlands have no chance. They're a fifth or sixth place team. And when I told him he was crazy, he said to me, that's why I like you. You're so positive. And I'm like, no, no, I'm realistic. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so yeah, like almost a weird vibe from Jeffrey. I, and I, to your point, I think very much he was... I think although he finished the MXGP season, I think making it to the final moto of the nations was a real moment in his mind where, okay, I did complete it now. And I heard yeah. someone told me that he got back to the truck after the race, high-fived his girlfriend and said, we did it. We did every race. Yeah. Which, again, kind of underlines where his head was at this year. Where his head is at going forward, without saying too much because this was off record, I think he does a two-year deal for 2026, 20, as I think we all know that's going to happen. It's not done. It's not even been negotiated yet, but I think that happens. He then spoke about another deal for MXGP for 28 and maybe 29. I think we have hurlings for a while. 
um, which is great news. After yeah, after this season, I think he'll probably be. I mean, didn't we say way back when? I mean, around the time of Argentina, that one of his goals for this year must just be to get through the year. You know, yeah. forget about wins or whatever. I mean, he did that last year. He passed the record. You know, he's not going to be getting ten world titles. I mean, maybe now if he signs for another five seasons to do it, he's looking at it, which wouldn't really surprise me. But then, you know, he he achieved one of his goals, and I think he was he's racing again this weekend, right? I mean, yes. uh, he's got like Volkan so, Swart, you know, international thing. Yes, I mean, I think he just decided I'm going to push my body. I'm going to enter as many races as I can because I've missed more than enough in my career, and just see what happens. And then finally have a break and reset and go again next year. Uh, I, I don't really, I don't know what to make of that. I mean, I'm one half of me is just full of, you know, um, exceeding admiration. And the other half, I kind of think, Jeffrey, like, prioritise a little bit, mate. I mean, try and get that world title, sack off these extra races, you know, look after your body a little bit more because it's it's not getting any younger. And then, um, you know, get get the big one. I, I believe that his head is in the space of this year was 2017. And if you don't remember, 2017... Uh, he came in injured, raced every race. That was actually the last time he did every race. Built himself up, narrowly missed the title. Uh, people get angry about that. Not narrowly, but built his way up and was in the picture at the end, whereas at the beginning, he was nowhere. So basically, yeah. similar to this year, it was a massive upward curve. And then the next year, 2018, he came out and absolutely decimated everyone with one of, if not the most dominant seasons in history. I think his head is at next year is 2018. That's how okay. he's making sense of all of this. All of this is with an eye to next year, it's on. And old Jeffrey is back and watch out. So I do think that as the, as round one of 2025 approaches, I think you see a shift in his comments, a shift in the way he holds himself. I think that's, I think this time next year, we are very much discussing old Jeffrey and how even if the riding isn't there, the demeanor is. Okay, yeah, that's, that's that's a good point. Let's see what we get in the first rounds of next year. But then, you know, anything can trip him up. I mean, look what happened, what, two years ago. I mean, an injury while doing a photo shoot, breaks his, his leg, and that's it. Uh, so, yeah, it does make all the um, the decisions to race as, as much as possible slightly odd, but also understandable from another perspective. Uh, I told you that I was going to find out what Fevra's improvements are that he wanted to make. I tried. He said he couldn't tell me. Which has got me even more like intrigued as to what he's planning. Um, but that's also Roman's innocuous way of saying, "Yeah, it's not much." Yeah, well, okay, maybe I'm maybe I'm getting too excited. So we have no you, clarification on that. Did you see his kind of um, very relaxed final moto sort of? I don't want to say collapse. He almost just like uh, rode to the side of the track and had to lay down. I thought he died. I honestly, I honestly, I thought he had a heart attack because it looked oh, the wow. way he the way he rolled and then tipped and then just laid there like I was because he didn't crash like he kept like all I could think is because he didn't hit his head I, I saw that he yeah. didn't hit his head I saw that he hit his chest so I was and the way he fell and didn't move I was like maybe he hit his chest so hard that he's just had a heart attack and I I I, I genuinely stood there thinking I think he might be dead. And then I thought to myself, there's no rider who's had more of those moments than Fevre. Like, we've discussed this before, the amount of concussions and just lifeless yeah. body on the side of the track. Matterley in 2016, 16. I think was his first major concussion. Um, it's, he scares me. I don't want to see this from him anymore. But it's kind uh, of... It was in a very... Thing. Yeah, and it's a very bizarre place to do it. And I'm thinking, don't you don't really want to sort of lie there I mean, if someone gets a bit out of shape, they're going to be on top of you. It was, uh, yeah, really strange. And then he made an Instagram post that kind of explained it wasn't as dramatic as it looked. But it looked um, horrific. Probably one of the scarier incidents I've seen, despite the fact yeah. that it was just a case of a jump. It was no, um, there was no crash. Um, anything else we need to do nations-wise? Like, do we want to discuss Team USA and how well they did? Or That goes without saying, doesn't it? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it goes without saying. I think... You know, uh, who is it? Somebody made a comment just saying, you know, it might have even been Jason Thomas actually on the live TV commentary that, you know, if offered P2 at the start of the week, then Team USA would have taken it considering the fact that they weren't even going to be there at one point. 
Um, I gather there was no sort of formal announcement by Roger da Costa that he's stepping aside in terms of the team manager role. But then also, uh, I'm kind of happy for Aaron Plesinger because, you know, I thought that his performance in NA and the way that went was terrible. Um, and he went back to have another go and, you know, made a decent fist of it. So uh, he got some sort of redemption, um, you know. Yeah, and also Eli Tomac as well. I think he, he did a typical Tomac attack in the beginning of that last moto, but then you could see just maybe a little bit more knowledge or feeling with those kind of European-style ruts, you know, was what counted against him and, and in the favour of others like Jet and Geiger. I think, well, if you think about it, this is America's first podium on European soil since 2016. Um, which is massive for them as a country having faith that they can do it. Because although outwardly there's a lot of confidence, I think that they did reach a point where they were like, the nations is in Europe, waste of time. Um, so for a, for the B team, it wasn't really a B team in the end, for the backup team, I guess, the reserve team, um, to come out and only be three points off of the victory, I think that should instill a lot of confidence and reinvigorate everyone a little bit but then also i said this after red bud in 2022 and then erne was a disaster as far as collecting riders so i don't know seeing, i would hope seeing the terrain and the way that matterly changed do you think it would have been ideal for someone like sexton tomac did so well that i don't know if chase would have done better but obviously if you had chase in place of plessinger then yes it would have that probably would have been the winning team um there was also a bit of hoo-ha after the race, because America tried to um, protest Australia. Uh, I can't remember the exact reason. Something like Hunter... Yellow flags? No. Hunter cleaned his grate with a towel or something. And that's there's apparently that's a grey area in the rules, because some people say you can't, and some people say you can. Nothing came of it, of course. Um, but there was a bit of a hoo-ha about that. Um, which all, I actually like, because that almost tells me that Team USA is so invested in the finer details, they aren't just here to take part. So I like, I admire that. That means they're all in. And that's what I want yeah, can, from... Can you imagine if that result had been changed? Wow. Uh, you know, I mean, I Australia we're... winning it for the first time since 47. First time ever in the history of it, and it gets reduced to a towel, a soggy towel. I think if that had happened, this podcast would be very, very different. Um, <laughs> maybe we just wouldn't have done it. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to think. As far as the nations go, I think we're good. I think we almost uh, yeah. talked about it more than we planned. So, current affairs. Somewhat nations related. Kai told me after the race that he is going to America on October the 21st to essentially do the Prado program. He is going to do two weeks of Supercross testing. And ultimately, that will decide if he commits to Europe or signs a deal in America for 2026. Rasmus is going with him. So we must do a podcast with Rasmus, actually, around mid-November. Um, there's a good chance that if this goes well, DeWolf races Paris. Ruben's going with him. So they're all in from a team perspective of making sure this goes well, um, which I said to Rasmus after the race. Kind of speaks to the quality of Nastan, because this is a, if this goes well, Nastan lose their golden child. And yet they're all in on almost supporting this experiment, which... Um, yeah, I like that. I really do. Um, do you, I mean, the thing is as well that Kai is a big guy for a 250. It would be so bizarre to see like a Dutch rider doing well in Supercross. And, you know, it hasn't even been confirmed what he's doing next year yet. I mean, is he going to be moving to a 450 or is he going to stay on a 250? That's something else that needs to be cleared up. Well, I interviewed Rasmus and Kai and they both said it's not been decided yet. But I think it has been decided. But yeah, seeing as they said, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, maybe. Uh, <laughs> um, um, well, with the, yeah. you know, with the, you know, your next piece of news is obviously going to be the Coonans. So therefore, you know, you would imagine that. Uh, also, we don't know what's happening with Andrea Adamo. I mean, does he move up to a bigger bike or not? If he stays in MX2, then you have the 2023 world champion, um, still a rider capable of putting a whole strong campaign together. Uh, that will be enough to placate Austria. Also, Sasha Kunin, you would think, if he stops crashing, will be winning a lot more motos. Uh, and then Liam Evitz, of course, as well, um, still in MX2. So why not push Kai up? So it's, yeah. Um, speaking of Adamo, he's unhappy with me on this podcast. So this is a public apology for that. Um, why? All the best. I can't remember. <laughs> Maybe it's for endless comparisons to Ramon. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I, I would presume that. That comes to mind immediately. Um, I heard that he was trying to find me to have a word at the nation, such tre- shivering my boots. Um, <laughs> so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I am sorry. I don't, I don't like that. I don't want people. And I also, someone told me that Simon is unhappy with the Woody comparisons, which, Simon, cut me some slack. I've been your biggest supporter for like four years. Like, I'm still yeah. far above everyone else. Like, let's cut Lewis some slack here. I mean, no one's perfect. I mean, surely but... Woody is one of the most iconic Pixar characters yep. of all time as well. I mean, it's not yep. like, uh, you know, it's a sort of shrinking flower. Yep. Um, and his second moto ride was phenomenal. So it was a nice character arc for Woody. Um, one of the more positive moments. Um but yeah, Anybody Kuna. else is angry with you? No, just those is what I heard. Which right, is weird. Okay. As I said to everyone, bizarre, because we do not touch MX2. So for me to piss people off in the five-minute segment <laughs> of MX2 is, is really quite impressive. Um, Lewis, um, I want you to take a $10 bill out of your wallet and put it on Kai for Supercross now. What is your gut feeling of how he'll do? Well... I almost feel like the experiment, similar to Prado, for it to be considered not good, um, it has to go horrifically. I think as long as he makes it around and doesn't do a Jeffrey in 2010 or whenever that was, and basically crash every two minutes, I think it's fine. And track. I don't think that happens. Yeah, that video's famous, I think. Um, so I, I don't think that happens. So I think it's fine. And Kai actually posted an Instagram story today of him riding some private supercross track in France, which obviously is an American spec. But he looked tidy enough, so I think it goes well, and I think he turns his attention to America. I do. I was confused for a moment, because when you said the Prado program, I was thinking you were talking about 2016, where he went over there as a teenager and basically spent all autumn and winter riding supercross test tracks you know, in the sort of way that had the likes of sort of Justin Brayton purring about what he can do. Uh, But yeah, I mean, so he's going to be doing obviously West Coast because it'd be the first Supercross of the year. Prado program, but not the racing part. Just for Ah, post, just for post Nations two-week test. Now, admittedly, at this point last year, Prado probably also said there's no way he's racing Anaheim 1. So you never quite know but I don't think that's on the plan at the moment. Um, yeah, way too hasty. Prado did it. Gautier Paul Anne did it in 2010. So it has... It, I wouldn't completely rule it out, but I think for the moment, it's not even on their minds. Um, right. But, yeah, interesting. So, also announced today, uh, the Coonans are officially going to Dakali. First reported by us. Chink for us. Well done. Golf claps. Um, Lucas on a 450, as expected. Sasha on a 250. As I tweeted, and I think this really encapsulates my view. Yes, I don't understand it, but I do think that Lucas could really surprise people. Yes, I do wonder why he's had to transfer out of the kind of nest that he had at Nestan, um, you know, with sort of Rasmus there. I mean, surely that's the kind of ideal environment to prosper. I, I I really don't know. Maybe it was I, too close to home with the whole Belgian thing and now he needs to go to Rome. I don't know. I think that maybe not Lucas, but certainly the immediate circle, there were some inaccurate suspicions or hunches that the team favoured Kai and they wanted Kai to, you know, standard team issue when two riders are battling for a championship. Right. And okay. I, I, think, I, I guess that makes sense. I think he goes to Dakali and feels like the number one rider also. Whereas um, at Nastan, Kai won the championship. So Kai will understandably be the number one rider, you would think. Although I don't think Nastan plays that game. I'm just trying to get into the head of how someone would view it. Um, a little bit of um, a little bit of trivia for you. Because anyone who's worked in the Dakali side, I think, has prospered. You know, you can go, obviously, Tony Cairoli, the most famous example, but then you could also go with, like, Glenn Koldenoff having a bit of a career push when he went to Rebel KTM and worked with Claudio and Davide there. Ken Dedeika, you know, had a sort of second win when he was riding the 450 there. Simon Lagenfeld has sort of taken his career up. Um, you know, you can look at Matteo Guadagnini, the, the finest sort of spell of his career was working with Dakalis as well. Uh, you know, I think there's there's obviously 
lots of lots of positivity from the Kunin family by heading and changing up that dynamic and, and basing themselves more in Italy and working with those guys. Well, this I've been meaning to raise this on a podcast recently. This is not my view, but someone recently told me the complete opposite of what you just said. They said if you actually oh. look at it, De Carli do, is does not help riders prosper. They said if you, besides Tony, besides Prado, they said if you look at the MX2 riders that have gone in there, they've kind of all just been, they've all either kind of stagnated. And I haven't actually looked into it enough. I'm just, I was surprised that this opinion is out there because I'm more lean to where you're at. But this opinion does kind of circulate a little bit. And I guess, has Lagenfelder progressed as I expected? Probably not. Has Guardanini progressed as I expected? Probably not. Um... But Guardanini, you know, didn't really. Yeah, his first year was phenomenal. Won his first Grand Prix. Won a, won a Grand Prix. Was leading the World Championship. Then it went off the rails, as you would expect, maybe of a rookie. You could say the sort of same thing of Lucas Kuhn in 2023. But I think if you look through the list of riders that the Carly have had, there's a lot more hits than there are misses. Yes, Mark Antoine Rossi was another. Didn't really do what we would expect before injury this year. Like you know. I would have to really sit down and think about this and look at the results and really try and understand. But I, my point is I was very surprised because I felt like um, unanimously we all feel very positive about Dakali and think that's a brilliant breeding ground. But some people are starting to doubt that, which, yeah, interesting. Well, I mean, I think, you know, KTM might have a slight hang up about the Kunins because, you know, they wanted the Porcells. Mm. I can remember Georges Jobe pushing extremely hard for KTM to sign Sebastian Porcel, which could have potentially dragged his younger brother along. I mean, imagine having those two in the Red Bull KTM setup. Uh, you know, I believe KTM were close to getting or they wanted to, to sign the, the Lawrences. Uh, didn't get those either. And now they have the Kunins. So I find it hard to believe that these two 17-year-old twins, you know, still so fresh in their their world championship or elite level journey that they're just going to sort of palm them off in some way. I think they've looked at the Dakali setup and thought, right, that is our baker's factory or that is our, that is our prime kind of Petri dish for, for growing these next level talents. So let's do it. I look at it differently. I think they put the Kunans there because the Nastan thing was a little fractured because of outside influence. Maybe they... They, could, they couldn't put... I think the, the dad is very adamant that the brothers have to be together because when they were signed for Diga, which would have been heading into last year, they were both going to be on Diga. When Diga folded and the, pa- the plan was to split them, one to and one Red Bull, I believe the dad almost started his own team because he was adamant that they must be together. Almost for... Basically almost turned his back on the factory teams that everyone wants to be on because he was like, no, we have to be together. So I think that they couldn't put Lucas at Red Bull KTM because that's Hurling's team, essentially, and you're not going to have two 450s yeah. there. And I think Dakali with Prado leaving, I think that was kind of the only place where they could put the Coonans and kind of meet some of the demands and hope for some happiness in the camp. Yes, okay. I mean, yeah, it is an outlet. But then I also think it's just a good environment for them to be in. So maybe it's a bit of both. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, maybe it ticked all boxes. And actually, it was like, almost like a happy accident where, oh my God, this works perfectly. Because if Prado yeah. was staying, I don't think this works. I really don't. If Put it this way. If Prado was staying, I think they remain in separate teams. I think Prado leaving, as bad as it sounds, Prado leaving alleviated that tent of some ego and allowed the ego to be replaced by the Coonans. That sounds terribly because yeah. the word ego has such negative connotations, but I genuinely mean it in a just in a top athlete perspective of what comes with that. Um, but does Lucas win the championship? I don't think so. Does he win GPs? I'm open to having that conversation. I really am. I could see him, you know, doing a bit of a Maxim Renault in his debut year and getting some sort of top three moto finishes and starting well, blending with a track and getting some results. Uh, yeah, I don't think that's beyond the realm of possibility. Dare I say, Lucas Coonan better than Maxime Renault. He's a better rider no. with more potential. No. Okay. I, I think I dare. Uh, I think also the 450 might eat him alive a little bit um, in his first year. I think he'll get tired and 
you know, there's he's still so young, the body's still developing to a degree, uh, even though he's the more mature and collected of the twins. Um, you know, I think we'll just we'll see a classic rookie season. There'll be some a lot of bright flashes because the talent is there, but also a lot of learning. Yep, fair. Um, and in more unfortunate news, uh, FNH is gone, as we know. Although some people say they're going to come back in 2026 as Triumph. I don't know how that works or what satellite team or I, I, just that seems to be out there, but I don't. I honestly haven't confirmed that. Um, and in honestly heart wrenching news, Standing Construct is gone, and Standing Construct, one of the most adored, respected, loved teams in the paddock. I think as far as a team goes where a lot of riders come, a lot of riders go. It's so easy to have bad blood or things end on bad terms. I'm not sure I know one person in the sport who has a bad word to say about Tim and Wim and Sanding Construct. Um, so a massive, massive loss to the MXGP paddock. Yeah, I, uh, I, I mean, I haven't seen any sort of official press release about it. I saw no, Alfa they, put, they put official. Yeah, Instagram. Yeah, Instagram post. But, you know, Tim is always... Uh, I mean, we've been very positive and, and sung the praises of the team and the way it's set up and the professionalism and the way they go racing. Uh, but, you know, he's always needed the backing of a manufacturer. He puts a lot of his own money in. I do wonder if maybe Honda Motor Europe tightened strings or not. I should have perhaps sent a message to Gordon Crocker before recording this this podcast. But uh, that might be something to do with it. Um, but, yeah, you have to feel sorry not just for the guys who, who, who work in the team, but also the likes of Ferrato, who now has to try and chase a deal in the off-season. Um, it's going to be complicated. But, yeah, a big miss. Um, two less goldfish bowls as well in the paddock. It's, uh, you know, it's a prominent team. It was, um, it was well set up. I'm sure that I'm not talking out of turn here, and I'm sure they won't mind me saying, but the reason they're going away is Honda made them an offer, and it essentially hadn't progressed from where they were previously. And I think the feeling was that they had justified GP winners with Honda, won a GP before HRC this year. I think the feeling was that they had justified their position within the Honda family to deserve a little more support. And they're, so essentially they, and I'm sure I'm not talking out of turn. Maybe I am, so I'm sorry if I am. But essentially the first offer from Honda was rejected and they were trying to find a way to basically make a better offer and that couldn't happen. Um, I guess the meet, there was a meeting at the Japanese MotoGP this weekend that was essentially the meeting that was going to decide if it stays or goes. So yeah, honestly, my only hope is that Standing Construct have disappeared before and they came back. So I just hope that they come back. And if they do, I'm certain that there will be a manufacturer that finds a place for them. I've heard that Hutton Metal may be in some trouble. Maybe they, maybe Standing Construct can fill that hole. I heard that VRT Yamaha could be in some trouble. Maybe maybe Standing Construct will be Yamaha one day. It's essentially what I'm saying. Go back to <laughs> Yamaha. Um, but, yeah, you know, no, I mean, I think manufacturers are sort of tightening belts. I mean, they're not selling as many bikes. It's uh, a bit of a volatile marketplace at the moment. You know, KTM, obviously their sort of budget cuts are uh, sort of, I don't know, quite public, I guess you could say, the way they've um, diluted some of the brands, removed gas gas from motocross. You know, uh, Ducati, for example, was selling more than 60,000 bikes two years ago. Now they're under that. Uh, so, you know, an expensive proposition to go mo motocross or off-road racing, you know, when you're at a point where you're losing, not losing money, but not making as, as much as before. You know, I think it's a tricky time. I think if you are a tier, if you are Tim Mathis and you run a well set up team like that, and you just don't get the support from the manufacturers, or you can't find that sponsor to be able to pick up the slack, then that's the situation you're faced with. It is a shame. I mean, with F and H and that team gone, that that's two kind of big teams missing from the paddock, Lewis, like you said. Yeah, and I feel less concerned about F and H going because I feel like the paddock has enough MX2 seats as we've covered. But the paddock desperately needed those two MXGP rides. Desperately. So, yeah. Um, nothing good to come of that at all. Um, so, yeah, as you mentioned, Paul Jonas signed a contract with another team a while ago. So this Jonas moving teams is not impacted by this at all. It wasn't spurred on by the fear of this happening. Jonas was moving on whether Standing was staying or not. Ferrato was pinning his hopes on remaining at Standing. So I don't know what he does now. Um 
Harrop was pinning his hopes on going to standing. I don't know what he does now. Um, Honda yeah, and also, when it comes to Honda Motor Europe and their budget, HRC are engineered to be winning races and winning titles. That's, you know, it's Honda Racing Corporation. That's their goal. Whereas Honda Motor Europe, their backing for motocross is more of a, you know, a marketing exercise. They want as many red bikes in the gate as possible to be able to show off the brand and the technology. So if, you know, uh, the likes of Gordon Crockhart is heading up this thing, if he has a set amount of budget, you know, he could throw everything on just two bikes and then have a situation this year where one's missing for half a season and the other one is missing for the first half of the season. Or he tries to spread it out and try and get four or five Hondas in there representing different territories, you know, maybe a promising rider from Sweden or from Eastern Europe or something like that. So it's it's a real kind of tricky of moving stuff around the table and there's only so much budget there i don't think it's not it's not something like a european manufacturer perhaps where you can make an impassioned plea and say my team is about to fold on you know i'm losing 15 years of grand prix racing history if i don't have any help and they try to get some budget from somewhere but uh yeah i mean it, as much as standings absence is going to be a blow for the paddock it's also sort of a big thing for honda motor europe as well to lose that sort of presence but you know it's um yeah i mean just as you were starting to list there lewis it's I hope there's somebody or someone who sort of steps up and, and plugs the hole. Well, um, I think it's worth explaining to American listeners as well. Whereas in America, it's very cut and dry American racing. Budget comes from American Honda. You have HRC, which obviously comes from Japan, the budget. Then you have Honda Motor Europe kind of below that, which is where Standing and SR to a degree and... JWR and teams like that get their budget from. But then actually, even below that, Honda SR get a large chunk of their budget from Honda France. And JWR got a large chunk of their budget from Honda Sweden. So it's really, although it all looks uniformed as Honda, there are lots of different um, branches and impacts from different areas. It's not as cut and dry as HRC saying, yep, we're going to have standing, we're going to have... it's." A little more complicated, but also maybe more positive because it opens up more avenues to succeed. I don't depends if you're a glass half full type person, I guess. Yeah, even just with bikes and spares and components, it's a it's a big old uh, construction. Um, also, one of the there will be a current MXGP team that becomes Honda's EMX two hundred and fifty team. So, kind of a return to Honda looking to build a pyramid structure, which is nice. I mean, good. I guess. I mean. Q rant where I say that we don't need EMX 250 rides, but <laughs> I I admire the fact that they're looking to build champions. And also I admire the fact I admire the fact that Polysport, All Balls Racing, and EVS Sports support this podcast. Hey Yamaha YZ125 or 250 riders, this one's for you. If you've been riding models from 2002 to 2021, listen up, because Polysport has something that's going to make your heart race. They're introducing the new restyling kit, a complete transformation for your Yamaha, giving your bike a 2024 look without any complicated modifications. The kit includes everything you need, a new gas tank, a full race seat, and an airbox, all designed to fit seamlessly. No fuss, no hassle. Just a fresh design that breathes new life into your dirt bike. It's time to transform your bike your yamaha deserves it polysport has what your need has what you need thank you to polysport and while i'm here all balls racing the all balls racing group is a combination of the finest aftermarket power sports brands from across the us and europe combining oem level engineering and design capabilities with a world-class supply chain makes them the largest global supplier of critical aftermarket hard parts for the power sports industry you can trust the All Balls Racing Group to provide the exact fitment and best quality in the industry at a price that fits your budget. All Balls Racing have everything to keep you running. Thank you to all involved, Polysport, EVS, All Balls Racing, for their support of this podcast. Any other current affairs we need to tackle? Anything on your mind? We don't have a, don't have a calendar yet. No, we know Argentina will start at a new track. There was a PR about that, and Australia will end. The in between is a grey area. Did you not think uh, that Jet Lawrence, having won everything, you know, before he can legally have a beer in the US, uh, just opens the door to, you know, doing MHGP and being world champion at one point? 
you would think so, but I think there's lots of riders before him who you could have had this conversation about and it didn't happen there, but then they aren't they haven't got the international flair. No, but like who? I mean what kind of uh, former you know, who who raced in Europe before they went to the US um, has won everything, every title there is, and then you know, there's only one thing left to win. I mean, Ken Roxon still has to get four fifty SX. So you'd understand if yeah. he, you know, even even if he hadn't made his life out there anyway, you know, there's a career goal there he's still chasing. Whereas if, you know, if you're jet and you've done everything, I mean, I would almost want to say the first Australian Grand Prix since 2001, count me in, you know, uh, how, how do I make it happen? You just like cross your fingers that there's no other race on that weekend. I, I don't know. I think that you get so wrapped up in the American bubble, though, that it's hard to like see beyond that. I really do. I think that's, um, I think that's a, a kind of a, a, a weakness or a detriment to people who move to America. Like you almost because the industry is so American focused. Whereas GPs, you go anywhere and people want to talk to you about America and stuff. In America, it's very much this is what matters and this is where we are. So I think that maybe you can lose a bit of perspective on what's possible. Um, either from a competitive point of view, like winning a championship, or even from a marketing play, like racing the uh, uh, Australian GP. Um, so I think that's to his detriment. But it is. I did find it a bit... I feel like we almost should have played on the fact more that the last time Jet raced at Matterley, he was in EMX 250, and I believe outside the top 15. He returns yeah. seven years later, even maybe six years later, um, and is has won everything. Is a factory Honda 450 rider and just wiped the floor with people like Hurlings and Geyser who were racing 450s on that weekend, but he was racing EMX 250. I feel like if we had a better TV package with more editorial direction, that would be a feature that they would play on in MotoGP or Formula One, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, 100%. I just think another half a decade, he's still going to be in his mid-20s. And he's still going to be going through a 32-33 race program every year. I mean, maybe you should jump into being a professional rally driver or, I don't know, try MotoGP or something. It's because uh, the talent is just off the scale. I mean, it, you know, it's uh, it's to the point where you want to kind of interview him to work out what, how he does it. But I don't think he'll be able to explain it to a satisfactory level to justify the the, the ability. And um, it's scary to watch just how, how good it is. And um, he just seems a little bit indestructible. We know he still has to pass through the, the dark days of injury and doubt and whatever else. But um, everything has to already be tipped, Lois. He's done the CV. He must have a bank account where he doesn't have to worry about working again. And I just think, uh, you know, if I was him, I would think, you know, I could, I could win absolutely everything in this sport. Um, you know, I'll go back and win EMX 250 if I have to. It's uh, why not? And, you know, what person is not going to open the door of their office when Jet Lawrence is walking in? True. Some people have theorised the uh, MotoGP thing. But to your point, uh, would we have not said the same about Hurlings in, like, 2012, 2013? Okay, injuries added an element to the conversation. No, 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 no. This is, this, this is way above and beyond. Because Jet has, like, won, won everything. I mean, there's no way you would have seen Jeffrey win in 450SX. You know, okay, the premier right. class, the super class. I mean, that that's what I'm saying. Jet has done everything in the US and he's ridiculously young. So, uh, you know, I just watching him win the nations now for the first time with Australia, you can think, well, there's another thing. I mean, it's almost like the Villa Podo 2011 where he does the double, then also wins the Monster Cup, then also wins the nations. But, uh, you know, Lawrence is just kind of years ahead of that. I actually wanted to ask you this question. So Australia just won the nations for the first time ever. What will be the next nation to win for the first time ever? Hard question, because there isn't an immediate answer, I don't think. Yeah, didn't uh, wasn't one of Paul Malin's statistics on the commentary something like only 10 nations have won in all these years that, uh, that, that it's been held since 47? I mean, it's a ridiculously low amount. We have had some new winners recently, though. Like, the Dutch won it for the first time in 19. Um, Latvia. That was where I was thinking. But you need to get the the Jonas and names I can't pronounce. Rezulis? Rezulis? 
Um, I actually asked a Latvian to tell me how to pronounce it, and I've forgotten. <laughs> um, I think it's Rizoulis. Um You have to get that combination just right, because if one of those riders isn't on form or injured or yeah. out or retired, in Jonas's case, five, six years down the line, that's not going to work. But that's definitely possible. Maybe Norway? If they can get the combination, but then they need an exceptional rider, and Hawkmo is great, but not going to win motos. Um, yeah. It's really hard to call. What about Spain? I well, mean, you'd imagine Spain in the next three to four years could suddenly have a thing where Fares is doing well in 250s. You know, Fernandez is established in MXGP and Prado is coming off the back of, you know, a strong season in the US. Uh, it could all come together and they win it. Yeah, and everyone doubts Oliver, but uh, after the second moto, Spain were in position to win potentially with Oliver so if they can potentially do it with Oliver they can certainly do it with Fares. Um, I think Spain only won the 2002 weirdo nations didn't they so it doesn't technically count or did they no, I think I Italy know. won it oh, okay or was it Belgium no 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 Belgium may have made the podium but yeah, Spain didn't win that one it was, I think okay. it was Italy so, so Spain is complete clean slate um yeah well in Spain is definitely the obvious pick um yeah, no doubt about that. Um, how about we end on this? I don't even know if I should say this. There are some people lobbying for me to email the ACU and put myself forward to manage Team GB in 2025. Should I do it? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I think you should uh, You should um, head the, 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 the PR. I mean, that would be a big step, you know, get the sort of the whole um, publicity bandwagon rolling. I think that would be good. Oh, but you doubt my ability elsewhere. Uh, yes. Oh. I, I think you get too excited. End. Yeah, and also, you know, I know now you've conquered your public speaking phobia. Uh, I do wonder how you would be there standing behind the team in the official press conference. That might be more nerve wracking for you. It would be ironic for me to talk outwardly to the press in the press conference before I've asked a question as press in the press conference. <laughs> It'd be a real weird career path. Um, no, I'm joking anyway. Obviously, I wouldn't do it, but it's a funny conversation to theorise. Um, just imagine, huh? It'd be a real... I feel like a lot of people would have a lot of laughs at the con at on that a concept. Sport, on Team GB subject and a sporting side again, pops to Comrade News because uh, that performance and that riding, uh, I, I wouldn't have expected it. And it was it was very cool to see him posting those results. Yes, 100%. I think I cannot even imagine the weight lifted off his shoulder to finally do it. Um, I can't remember exactly, but I looked... Erne last year, 25-23, uh, significantly weaker nations. At the more stacked nations, he went 6-19 with a broken ankle in the second race. There's no... The difference between this time last year and this time this year, there's no comparison. And yeah. finally... Like, I almost messaged... Like, I'm not necessarily close with Conrad. Like, I don't talk to him. But I almost messaged him last night and was like, fuck, like, I, I cannot even imagine how... What this feels like. Like, it must feel like winning a championship just to... Because you wonder, can you do it? What if? But just to finally do it, like, imagine. Imagine what that feels like. Yeah, and the British crowd as well really get behind the riders. I'm sure he enjoyed it. Um, oh. You know, obviously not the pain of the injury, but uh, the, the whole experience in riding well. Obviously, the question is, was it because it was on British soil? I don't think so, because there's no way that, there's no way that he mentally tricks himself and goes, this is like a British championship. Like, there's no way. I wonder if it's having to face hurlings all year, if that just changes your... It must do something to your psyche staring at that 84 on a jersey and having to mentally gear up to battle him each week. That must do something. Um, so I would lean to that being the result, which would mean that this should carry on, but then it didn't really transpire at Lommel or Arnhem, so I don't know. Jury's kind of out. But nonetheless, superb to see that come to fruition. Um, so well done to him. Uh, and well done to EVS Sports for protecting riders around the world, professional or not, with their extensive line of protection gear. Experience the pinnacle of knee protection and injury prevention with the new EVS Web Eclipse Knee Brace. For over 39 years, EVS has relentlessly honed their engineering expertise, consistently delivering award-winning knee protection. This legacy of excellence is embedded in every facet of the new Web Eclipse, which represents the culmination of their tireless dedication to innovation and rider safety. Thank you to EVS, All Balls Racing, and Polar Sport. Any final thoughts, Adam Wheeler? 
no, that's the off season. Uh, goodness, mm-hmm. not much uh, going on. I guess. Uh, well, 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 I mean, I've got still got. Oh right, really? I oh, was still going, is it? <laughs> yeah. The the CEO <laughs> um, was actually at the nations. Oh right, okay. Well, I mean, that's another cool thing about the nations. You have a lot of kind of influential people that actually turn up to see motocross, and that's. Uh, you know, it kind of reminds you that the sport does hit home and there are people paying attention, which is an important thing because it keeps the, the ball rolling. Uh, but I've still got another four rounds of MotoGP and I will be going to Thailand in two weeks' time. And then the final round at Valencia, that that championship could also go down to the, the final laps of the season. So uh, if people were kind of starved of action and, um, you know, go and look at MotoGP.com because... I think it's going to boom a little bit next year with Liberty Media taking control as well. There could be some changes on the way it's kind of presented or distributed. So, yeah. And you recorded a Paddock Pass podcast this morning. So once people have reached this part of this podcast, they should go and check out that, I presume. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The, well, you uh, said there was Nations TV. talk. So there's even more yeah. reason for these people to go and listen or two of our listeners. Only fleetingly. Only fleetingly. Oh, okay. I won't, oh, by the I way, won't. did you see that Tony Bowe won another world championship in trial? That's like something like 36 world championships that man has now. Oh, Ridiculous. Let me, let me Google how old this man is. Oh, he's only 37. I genuinely would have said he's pushing 50. I feel like that name has been around and winning forever. No, I mean, that's that's a level of motorcycle control that, you know, is unbelievable. And to still be sort of setting the mark at that age, how many years on? I've done sort of interviews with Tony over the years and just, uh, wow, 36 world championships. How, does trials have multiple world championships in a year? Yeah, they have an indoor and outdoor. It's kind of like Supercross Motocross. But still, that's 18 years of winning both titles. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was expecting you, you to go, oh yeah, the math's wrong. No, okay, that is a, that is the result. Okay, uh, good to know. And when can we buy your book? Ah, uh, well, I mean, we're gonna, you're going to be sick and tired of hearing this. It's not going to be out till next year. So we'll... Okay. But like uh, early maybe next we'll, year? Late? February, yeah. Okay. Pre-season, pre-season MotoGP 2025. Okay. Um, Don't worry, Lewis, I shall be sending you one for you to prop your door open at home. Do you... Random question that no one cares about. As for author, do you decide what the book costs or is that the publisher's job? No, that's the publisher's job. You get paid in advance. So they pay you on books that you'll sell. So hopefully you, you sell a few. And then, uh, yeah, they decide. And I always prefer paperback books. You know, I might hate these big kind of, I don't hate, but, you know, hardback, these big massive things that cost like 20 quid. Uh, you know, I always prefer to have like a, sort of paperback version well that the book comes out initially in the hardback because obviously it's more profitable so uh, it will also be um in digital so people that read books on their tablets or via a kindle you can get it there and there'll be an audio version are you reading the audio version uh, i don't know uh, that i don't know but if okay. i don't then i have to explain how you pronounce names of certain riders and circuits and whatever else no, yeah, you need to do that. But it would be the most painful experience, I think. Because you would essentially <laughs> sit in a you would sit in a studio for what, eight hours? Just Maybe even reading. two days. I yeah, mean I think it's it is like more. 100, 160,000 words. It's uh, yeah, it's a long old thing. Well hopefully by the time you come to that, AI has perfected your voice enough where you can just give it to AI <laughs> and then it will be generated quite quickly. Um right, so we're good? We're good. Okay, thank you everyone for listening to this episode of the MXGP Podcast Show. Thank you to EVS, Polar Sport and All Balls Racing for their support. Thank you to MXGP in 2024 for providing a great championship with a lot to see and a lot to talk about. Thank you to Jorge Prado, Jeffrey Hurlings and Tim Geiser for being the main characters in this fantastic story. I think I've already thanked you people for listening, but hey, you get two of those. And thank you to Adam Wheeler for sticking with me all season long. We will be back soon-ish in the off-season to discuss something. So if you've got something on your mind, let us know. Great. Great job, Lewis. Oh, well, I was kind of teeing you up to say thank you to me, but thank you. So thank you for realising, taking a social cue. Um, Like I said, we will be back soon. It won't be too long. Thank you again for your support, and we will see you real soon.